Dr. Torres, the nurse called loudly over the voice pager. The patient in room 225 is starting to wake up, lifting one eyelid after another and shining a light into her eyes. The doctor spoke to her in his usual monotone voice. Mrs. Moore, can you hear me? He checked her pulse and heartbeat and glanced at the monitor again. Nurse, she's waking up. Check the contacts in her file and call everyone listed there. Tell them it may take one to five hours, but she's definitely waking up. About three hours later, Laura woke up, albeit barely, but she woke up nonetheless. Welcome back to life. Don't try to talk yet, the nurse said, as she gave her clear liquid through a straw. When you feel strong enough, you will be able to sit up. But be patient. You've been asleep for a while now, and don't worry. Your family has already been notified. So just relax and let your body wake up fully. You'll feel much better in an hour or two, she said, taking her pulse once more and writing the results on the chart. She shook her head, groping for all the wires and objects that were still attached to her. Laura could tell she was in some kind of hospital, but she couldn't remember which one. She could see and hear what was going on around her. But her brain was still failing. She held up her hands and looked at all the tubes coming to her. Don't worry. We'll take all these things out soon. We just want to observe you for a while longer. Your arms, legs, and the rest of your muscles haven't been used in a while, so it will take time for them to get used to the movement. I know you have a million questions, but just be patient. You've been through quite an ordeal, and you don't need any shocks right now. Relax, and in due time you will have all your questions answered. The nurse smiled once more and left the room through the closed blinds. Bright sunlight streamed into the room. It was daytime, but what time of day was it? Still not recovering. She began to feel a little better. Looking around her room, she saw a few magazines, a sweater, and other personal items. Just then, Laura noticed a picture of her and what she thought was Randy. It was a picture of her daughter, Randy. It was on the dresser too far away to pick it up, but at least she could get a good look at it. She looked around the room once more to see if there were any other pictures, but there were none. She closed her eyes and took a deep breath. I'm alive, she said to herself. About four hours later, after she had tried to finish her first real meal, a nurse entered the room. How are you feeling? Better. But next time, could we order Mexican food? This elicited a chuckle from the nurse. Well, if your appetite has returned to you, I suppose you're strong enough to take a couple of visitors, she said looking toward the door. There's a certain young lady who's been waiting here for three hours. She's been running around the hallway like a cat in a cage, and has informed me that if I don't let her in here soon, I'll need three orderlies to hold her down. So if you agree, I'll let her in. But there's always a but, isn't there? But if your vitals go up, I'll throw her out. Do I make myself clear? Laura nodded and raised herself even more on the bed. She was right. Randy came running in the door. Mommy, mommy! She screamed with tears in her eyes. She kissed her mother's face and hugged her. Randy began to cry. I thought we had lost you when they said you'd never wake up. I told them they were wrong and that you'd fight back. How do you feel? Are you in pain? Do you need anything? The questions poured in non-stop as she wiped her eyes with her sleeve and sniffled. You've lost a little weight, Randy said. But don't worry. When you get out of this place and start eating real food, you'll gain it back in no time. Mom, it's so good to have you back, she said, giving her another hug. The doctor told me that if everything goes right, you should be able to check out of here by the end of the weekend. Gosh, you look great, Mom. Randy began to calm down little by little. She was glad to see her mother awake for the first time in six months. It had been a long journey with a few potholes, but her mom was back, and she would make sure her homecoming was something special. When she noticed, her mother began to fidget and look back at the door a few times. Randy's face drained a little. Does she remember? And if she did, how much? These were just some of the questions that eventually needed answers. And, then there was what Randy had been carrying in her purse for the past two months. Her father had given it to her, and asked her to run a small errand. She had agreed, but now that her mom was awake, she wasn't sure she could do it anymore. Does everyone know I'm out of the coma and ready to receive visitors? Mom, I called everyone on the way here, but I asked most to give you a day or two to recover. That way you won't get hit right away. The doctor told me to make sure you stay calm and threatened to kick me out if I upset you, so I'm trying my best not to. When her mother threw her a strange look, she guessed what would follow next. Laura had this detached look on her face. She seemed to be trying to remember something. Finally, she asked Randy the question she had been dreading ever since she had entered her room. Please, 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 please let it be something else, Randy pleaded. But it wasn't. Mom, he's not coming. 
I called him on the way over here to let him know you were awake, but he said he wasn't coming. Laura had a sad look on her face, as if she'd expected that, but was hoping for a different answer. Evan said he would come tomorrow after work, and Grandma and Grandpa are coming tomorrow night. Your sister Patty is on her way, and should be here in about an hour. I asked her to give us some time alone, just the two of us, before she gets here. Mom, I'm so sorry, Randy said, and saw the look on her mother's face. It's been really hard on all of us since the accident, but things have pretty much settled down. Do you want to know what happened in the world while you were asleep? We elected the first black president. Isn't that wonderful? The economy is still in the hole, but it's getting better. And your boss said your old job is waiting for you when you're ready to come back. Isn't that great? Randy tried to stay away from the dreaded subject, but knew there was no getting away from it. Her purse felt like it weighed 1,000 pounds, and she finally placed it on the bedside table. Randy knew she shouldn't upset her mother, but she was getting there, and through no fault of her own. For the next hour, they talked about everything and nothing. They looked at each other, and Randy said someone had been here with her most of the time. Laura asked how everyone was holding up, and said she was sorry she had been such a burden. Mom, you weren't a burden, and if that man hadn't run the red light, none of this would have happened. I don't know if anyone told you what the heck I'm thinking. Of course you don't know. He died in an accident. The report says he died from the impact. That statement put a sad expression on Laura's face. Well, enough of that. You're awake, and you'll be as good as new. I'll make sure to fatten you up. It'll be just like old times. Laura looked at her daughter and said it would never be the same again. She remembered how she got here. Not the accident, of course, but how it happened. She remembered yelling at Ed to slow down. She remembered screaming when she saw the truck before it hit them. After that, it was like a clean slate until she woke up this morning. Do you think your father will talk to me? Asked Laura, but Randy only shook her head. Mom, maybe later. Things have gotten sidetracked since you got here. Everything is still too new and raw. Maybe in a week or two, Dad will come around. Randy told her they both knew that wasn't going to happen. Daddy said to give you this when you wake up. Randy handed her a white envelope without stamps. I don't think you should look at it until at least tomorrow. Aunt Patty will be here soon. And remember, the doctors want you to stay calm. I'll come and see you tomorrow morning. Say hi to Aunt Patty for me. As Randy was leaving the hospital, she noticed her Aunt Patty enter the room. Does she know? Was the first question that came out of Patty's mouth. Not yet, but I gave her a letter from Daddy. I told her not to read it until tomorrow, but I'm sure she's reading it right now. Maybe I should wait a little while before I go up. Let her have a little time to herself. Aunt Patty, the last thing she needs right now is to be alone. She's been alone in her mind for the last six months. She needs our support now, and a lot of it. If she's going to survive the next couple of months. You're probably right. I just don't know how I'm going to face or after everything that's happened in the last couple months. My parents are still mad at me. Your dad said he never wants to see my face again. And even your brother hasn't forgiven me yet. You're the only one who still talks to me. Aunt Patty. I learned many months ago that judging others is not good. It only causes anger and hatred. I've had enough of both. So go say hello to your sister. Tell her you love her, and I'll see you later. Patty went upstairs and walked slowly down the hall. She had a cheerful attitude and didn't say a word about Steve. When she entered her room, however, tears were streaming down Laura's face. She tried to hide behind the door, but Laura saw her with tearful eyes and arms spread out. She ran to her for the next half hour. Laura poured her heart out on her shoulder, and Patty began to cry too. Laura was exhausted beyond belief. The nurse, watching the vitals called for the doctor, and the doctor, pushing Patty aside, injected Laura with something to calm her down and put her to sleep. The doctor was incredulous when Patty told him she wasn't going to leave. He said Laura would probably sleep through tomorrow morning so she could sit there, but he firmly warned her before he left. If she gets upset again, I will ban everyone from visiting her. She's not well, and what she needs most is calm. The doctor scolded Patty as if he were chastising one of his nurses. Patty told him she would just sit in the chair next to the bed and read before he left. He warned her again not to worry Laura. He didn't realize that it wasn't Patty, but the letter Laura held in her hand that had upset her so much. Laura was back in La 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 Land again. She looked peaceful as she had for the past six months, but this time she was to wake up to a whole new life. On the floor beside her bed was a stack of papers. Patty picked them up and placed them on her lap. She glanced at the first page and shuddered. No wonder Laura was so upset. As she flipped through a few pages, she came across one wet with tears and realized 
This is how far Laura had come before losing it. Patty felt sorry for her sister, but she was angry with herself. It wasn't supposed to end this way, but knowing Steve, it was the only way it could end. She turned off the overhead light and turned on the small lamp on the night table. The illumination was enough to make out what was written on the pages. Fortunately, they were all stapled together, so she turned the first page and began to read. Oh my God, was all Patty could say as she read the first paragraph. Chapter 1 For the past three weeks, I had been watching and listening to that monitor now and then, but the constant beeping, 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 beeping was about to throw me off balance. The hospital allowed me to come and go as I pleased, but I was starting to get a little tipsy from lack of sleep. Soon I was going home, and for once I tried to get a good night's sleep. After the surgery, the doctors were very optimistic. They all said that the pressure on the brain had eased, but it would take time for the swelling to go down. They hoped it wouldn't be too long, but they couldn't say for sure. Does that mean she'll wake up? I asked the doctor. He realized I was begging for the answer I was hoping for. Mr. Moore, your wife is in a coma, and although it is not very deep, it could still be one day, one week or three months. We cannot determine when she will come out of it. Her injuries have been addressed, but the body sometimes does this on its own to heal itself. The likely cause is a head injury, and we just have to wait. Just be thankful she's alive. I was thankful that Laura was alive. Unlike the driver of the car she was riding in, he was not wearing a seatbelt and took the brunt of the accident. The paramedic said he died almost instantly, and they weren't sure of my wife's chances until the fire department pulled her out of what was left of the car. And here I sit and wonder why. Dad? My son! Evan shouted, running into the room that first day. How's mom doing? Randy's on her way, but she told me to call her as soon as I knew anything. I told them that their mother had been in surgery for 16 hours, and her condition was as good as could be expected. Broken ribs, a head injury, a broken ankle, and numerous fractures completed the list of her serious injuries. I told them that the biggest problem was that she had hit both the front and side of her head, and the surgeon had to drill holes in her skull to relieve the internal pressure. Look, son, I don't understand everything, but if you believe even half of what they tell me, your mom will make a full recovery. It'll take some time, but she'll be perfectly fine. I wish I could say that about myself. The kids stopped by every day to see how she was doing and prayed to God that she would wake up. I, on the other hand, became a regular visitor to the hospital for the first couple weeks, eating lunch, mostly in my wife's room. I would stop by McDonald's Chinese food or bring a large pizza that I shared with the nursing staff. Basically, I was just procrastinating until she woke up. How's Laura doing? Asked Keith, my boss. She's recovering and the doctors say she should be waking up any day now. I lied. Well, we'll be praying for her, he said, patting me on the shoulder. If you need any extra vacation time, just say the word. Thanks for the offer, but working here keeps me sane and sane. It's the only place where I can take my mind off of it all and be somewhat normal. Well, if anything arises, just let me know. I thanked him again. Everyone had been too kind to me. Five days after the accident, I was at the police station getting a copy of the accident report. I could have gotten it sooner, but I needed time to gather my thoughts before reading what had happened. The police report stated that the Lincoln Town Car, in which Laura was riding, was traveling at a high rate of speed down Boylston Street. The car ran a red light at the corner of Boylston and Fifth Avenue. A UPS truck, which was running a green light, crashed into the driver's side of the Lincoln. There were skid marks on the car, but the UPS driver said that when he saw the car, it was too late to stop. The driver estimated that he hit them at approximately 25 to 30 mil piot. The driver of the Lincoln, Mr. Edward Carver, was pronounced dead at the scene, and his body was taken away by the medical examiner. I thought about it for a minute, and there was no way I could remember that name. I looked up his home address and saw that it was across town from where we lived. Later that evening, I looked online and found that he was married to a woman named Carol, and they had an eight-year-old daughter. When I arrived at the hospital after work, I found Randy there, giving my wife an arm and leg massage. Dad, I've read that physical stimulation can sometimes bring a person out of a coma. Why don't you lie on your other side and work on her other arm, she said as she handed me the massage oil. We rubbed for about an hour before we finally stopped. I plan on doing this a couple times a week until she wakes up. I also recorded her favorite songs and put them on her iPod. I bought a headset and will have the nurse turn it on every night. Something should work. Honey, the doctor said it will take time. 
Her brain hasn't fully healed yet. It's only been three weeks since the accident. I hope you sue the father. The UPS driver. He could have killed mom. Honey, the driver of the car your mom was riding in ran a red light. He was at fault. Great. And he's dead. What an idiot. What the heck was he thinking? Have you contacted his widow yet, Randy? She just buried her husband. For heaven's sake, leave the poor woman and her daughter alone so they can grieve. I guess you're right. I'm thankful my mom is still alive. I mumbled in response. The only thing they didn't mention in the police report was that I was in the car right behind them and saw everything with my own eyes. Three weeks earlier, I was sitting at my desk finishing up my production schedule for the rest of the week. I leaned back in my chair, stretched, and glanced at the clock. 11.21, and then an idea popped into my head. Why not surprise my wife for lunch? Heck, it would be boring after lunch. So I decided to take a couple hours off and surprise my wife. Laura worked about 25 minutes away from my office, and I figured if I left right now, I could make it just in time for lunch. I contemplated grabbing something, but decided I'd grab her and let her make her own decisions about where to eat. This is going to be so great, I thought to myself as I made my way through the traffic in the pre-lunch hour. At one of the stoplights, I hovered and was about to call her, but I fought the urge. I wanted to see the look on her face when I walked in. What do they say on television? Priceless. It was five minutes to twelve when I turned the corner in front of her building, just in time to see her get into a black Lincoln Town car. Darn. Too late, I said, hitting the steering. Wheel. She must have a business lunch with a vendor. I berated myself for not calling and was about to head back to work when I saw her kissing her. It wasn't a big, passionate kiss with tongue piercing. More like just a smack, but it was still a kiss. Now I had another reason to be there. They left, and I lurched right behind them, my brain asking me question after question that I had no answers for. I guess I'm not the most composed and patient person in the world, because at the first stoplight, I got out of the car. I ran to the driver's window and tapped on the glass with the back of my knuckles. The bewildered look on the driver's face was nothing compared to the look of horror I saw in Laura's face. Open the darn door, I shouted through the glass. The light turned green. The car jerked forward and quickly pulled into the street. I ran back to my car and even though everyone honked at me, I heard nothing. I kept my eyes on the black Lincoln, breaking through the stream of cars ahead of me because of the slow lunch hour traffic. It didn't take me more than two minutes to catch up with them. I flashed my headlights at them, trying to get them to stop, and then he gave a yank. I stopped at a red light as he attempted to speed through the intersection, with attempt being the key word. The UPS truck slammed into their car with a deafening crash. It dragged it through the entire intersection. I saw the first impact, but both vehicles immediately disappeared from sight. I just sat there, unable to believe what had just happened. By the time I snapped out of my stupor and climbed out of the car, I heard police sirens wailing. Someone was yelling for me to move my darn car. There were probably 30 people already gathered around the damaged car and truck. I sat back down and pushed the car to the curb as I made my way to the car. I was more than wary of what I would find. I pushed the gawkers aside and approached Laura's car. I could see that she was unconscious. I tried to open the door, but it was locked. No sooner had I looked out the window than a million uniform police and ambulance personnel arrived on the scene. Everyone, including me, was pushed back while the rescue workers tried to pull the two out of the car. They had to use the jaws of life to open the doors. I could see that the driver was in bad shape, and after a few minutes they put him on a stretcher and covered him with a sheet. I realized he was gone. They worked on Laura for the better part of 15 minutes. The paramedic was inside with her, while the two firemen tried to open the door and move the dashboard away from her. When they yelled for a stretcher to be brought in, my heart beat faster. She was still alive. My name is Stephen Moore, I said to one of the paramedics. This is my wife. What hospital are they taking her to? To the county hospital. It's the closest, and she needs immediate emergency care. Do you want to go with her in the ambulance? No, I have a car. I'll meet them there, I said, and ran back to my car. They were ahead of me, but not by much at the emergency room. I told them who I was and provided all the necessary information. I then proceeded to fill out a lot of forms. They said she was on her way to surgery and let me know where I could wait. I must have spent the next couple hours sitting in silence, emotionless, and in a daze. A nurse came up to me once, and the second time I gave her the forms I had filled out. How long will she be there? I can't give you a time frame but it will be at least a few more hours. Your wife has suffered a lot of injuries, but don't worry. 
We have the best surgeons on staff working on her right now. She smiled at my glassy eyes and moved on to the next person, and I didn't want to call our kids until I knew something definite. So I waited and waited and waited for the doctor to walk through those darn swinging doors. Mr. Moore, they're just finishing up. The nurse told me the doctor will be out in about 20 minutes to explain to you how she's doing. Half an hour later, the doctor in the green coat told me how she was feeling and what I should expect. For now, she was going to be kept under sedation because they didn't want her to move. Her head would be secured with straps to keep her immobile. And then he told me about the fact that she would have to have her skull drilled. Mr. Moore, it's not as bad as it sounds, and your wife has come through the surgery quite well. She's not out of the woods yet, but everything went as expected. We'll know more in about 12 to 24 hours. Go home and get some rest. There's nothing you can do here. He was right, but I stayed anyway. Evan, it's Dad, I said into my cell phone. Mom's been in an accident. I talked to him while he got dressed and left the house. He said he would call Randy and meet me in 20 minutes or less. Drive carefully. I don't want to have to visit two people here. He showed up. Randy showed up. And I brought them up to speed. After three cups of coffee, I talked to them into leaving. I told them I would stay until she was out of rehab and placed in a room. I'll call you if anything changes. I told the two of them. Go home and get some sleep. There's nothing you can do right now. I almost physically had to remove them. When the doctor informed me the next day that Laura had slipped into a coma, I thought, what else could go wrong? However, by the second day, if I heard someone tell me that going into a coma after such an accident was not uncommon, I started screaming. So days passed. Day after day, week after week, without any change in her condition. She was getting better, but she was still in that darn coma. I watched her for hours. She looked so peaceful, with a dozen tubes and wires sticking out of many parts of her body. The cuts on her face and forehead were almost completely healed, but she would probably need plastic surgery to reduce their appearance. I went to work, spent my evenings at the hospital, and only came home to sleep. Life sucked. If it wasn't for the phone call that came late one night after returning from the hospital, I would have stayed in the same rut. Mr. Moore, the female voice on the other end of the line, asked in a slightly hesitant voice, Yes, this is Stephen Moore. Can I help you? I replied in my usual tired voice. Mr. Moore, my name is Carol Carver. My husband was Edward Carver. I stopped her where she stood. Mrs. Carver, I know who you are, and let me take this time to tell you how sorry I am for the loss of you and your daughter. Thank you. Can I ask you about your wife? She's still in a coma, but the doctors said they expect her to come out of it soon and make a full recovery. Thank you for asking, I replied. Mr. Moore, I need to ask you a sensitive question. I know I may be out of line, but I still need to ask, she said her voice shaking but getting a little louder. Why was your wife in the car with my husband? I paused for a moment. That's the $10,000 question, isn't it? I finally answered. For the next hour we talked, or should I say, exchanged bits of information as to whether they were having an affair. Neither of us had any idea. Ed wasn't due back in town until late at night when they called me. I told them they had the wrong Edward Carver. My Ed Carver's plane wasn't due until 9.30 that evening when the police said they confirmed his identity from his driver's license and credit cards. I was confused. I doubted myself and thought about telling her that I had everything to do with her husband's death, but she probably would have hung up on me. In that case, I'd never know if the affair was real or if he was just a close work friend. Carol, what exactly did your husband do for a living? He worked for Canon. He leased copiers and printers to businesses in the Southeast. The last I heard was that he was finishing up work in Macon, Georgia, and would be home around 10.45 at night. I didn't bother telling his boss about it, since I'm still on Ed's health insurance for the next three months. I can't jeopardize that. Did you go through his emails and text messages on his phone? I picked up his laptop and cell phone from the impound lot. And while your wife's company is listed, there was nothing unusual there. I don't want to believe he was cheating on me, but now I just want to know for sure. Carol, why don't I check something out on my own and get back to you in a couple of days? There may have been something, but to what extent? I can't say for sure. We exchanged cell phone numbers and I went looking. Nothing. I found nothing. If they were having an affair, I found nothing. The only time we weren't together outside of work was when she and her sister went out to dinner or shopping together. Heck, sometimes I even joined them. So I knew there was nothing funny there. Friday night I went through my bedroom room and garage looking for something. I didn't know what exactly I was looking for, just something out of the ordinary. No emails, no messages, no unreported expenses like hotel rooms or anything like that. 
Thank goodness I wasn't getting anywhere. I even went so far as to go to her workplace and inspect her desk. My excuse was that one of Laura's credit cards was missing, and I needed to either find it or report it stolen. Like I said, nothing. I talked to Carol and even invited her to lunch to compare notes, but she decided that would be inappropriate given the circumstances. So we just talked on the phone, after about six weeks. Neither of us could find any connection between them, other than the fact that Ed's company owned a copier lease at Laura's workplace. They were probably just meeting for lunch to discuss renewing the lease. I said, not quite believing what I told her. After all, I'd seen the kiss if it had been a kiss on the cheek like the two friends had. It would have faded from my memory by now. But it wasn't. It was on the lips, and it didn't seem to be the first one she'd given him. It was too automatic and casual like it was expected. You don't believe that any more than I do, Carol said Carol. Neither of us have found anything. Nothing to tie them together, Steve. Deep down, I know there was something here. But you're probably right. Anyway, what's the point of this? I just wish I could get it over with. You have a wife. And even though she's in a coma, she's still alive. Mine is dead. Buried, but not forgotten. Now, when I hear someone say what a good husband and father Ed was, I shudder because I think he might have cheated behind my back. And it drives me crazy. I guess it doesn't make a difference now. But would you do me a favor if I can? If and when your wife wakes up, please find out for me what was really going on. I guess it makes no difference to me now, except that these lingering thoughts will drive me crazy if he cheated. Well, he paid a heavy price for it. But if he didn't, I don't want to dislike him for the rest of my life. You know what I mean? Don't worry. I'll help you deal with it. Because I need it myself, too. That's how life went on for the next couple months. I went to work, to the hospital, and finally home to sleep. Day in and day out, my schedule was like a clock ticking. Then out of the blue, I got a call from Carol. Steve. Ed's work sent over a box of personal items that I missed, as well as mail that went directly to his work. Among those items were two visa bills for an account I never knew about. The bills showed charges for a stay at a Hilton hotel near the center of town. As far as I could tell, he rented a room there once a month. The only problem is that he had to be on the road every one of those days. I was beginning to forget how this was all happening, but now the new information brought me back to reality. Carol, you can name the last three or four dates and I'll try to match them somehow to what we were doing at the time. She gave me the last four, and I told her I would get back to her. I can remember what I did two weeks ago, but the last date was almost 18 weeks ago. I came home, looked at our kitchen calendar, and after drinking a Corona, I tried to remember what had happened before. I was unsuccessful, but I found where she and her sister had dinner on the previous date. Then I remembered that Carol had said she had checked Ed's day planner. Everyone at Laura's work wanted to know how she was feeling, and the only answer I could give them was that she was stable, but her condition hadn't changed. This time, I knew exactly what I was looking for, and I found it in her desk drawer, a day planner. I took it and headed back to my car. On the way home, I snacked on Chinese food, because cooking for one was becoming just unbearable. Taking our kitchen calendar, her workday planner, and the dates Carol had given me. I started checking them off of the four dates. Laura had gone out to dinner with her sister on one date and shopping on another. The other two dates I had no idea about, and they didn't fit into the pattern of the others. I called Carol. I have both good and bad news. I told her on two of the dates you mentioned. My wife was with her sister, and on the other two, I missed. Are you sure she was really dating her sister? Now Carol opened another can of worms. I guess I can't put my life on the line, but they've been seeing each other for years, Steve. That's not what I'm asking, and you know it. Would her sister live for her if she was having an affair? Darn it. Why isn't this? Going away? That's something I can't be sure of? I know her sister well, but I can't imagine if she would lie for her. Steve, I know I'm being a pain in the butt, but I'm trying to put a stop to my marriage and the wonderful life I once had. I can't tell you how to proceed. It's up to you. But I'd sure like to know if it was me. Call me if you hear anything. I wished he would just go away and die but Carol wasn't going to let that happen. However, the next step was tricky at best, and could change my life forever. At the three, Coronas had given me enough courage without dumbing down my brain too much. I thought about doing it face to face, but immediately discarded the idea. I didn't want Laura's sister Patty to see the look in my eyes as I set the hook and got prepared. I swallowed hard when I heard her answer the phone. I wondered if I would still be in one piece by the end of this conversation. Steve? Is something wrong? I'd forgotten that she could see who was calling with Laura. No, 
no change. And the doctor said she could come out of it any day now, of course. They've been telling me that every day for months. Well then, what can I do for you tonight? I took all the slack out of the fishing line and prepared to bait the hook. I know about Laura and Ed. I stopped at that statement and waited for her reaction. Who is Ed? And what about Laura? Steve? I don't know what you're talking about, was her cautious response. I think you do, Patty, because you've been her alibi all these years. How could you? I felt the hook go deep into her flesh. Steve, you're wrong. Laura would never. I stopped her. Ed's wife has receipts from the hotel. And during each of those dates, my lovely wife had dinner or went shopping with you. If it hadn't been for the hotel cameras, there's no way I would have believed even myself. It's hard for me to believe now that two people I cared so much about could lie to me all this time. I lied through my teeth, but there was only silence on the other end. Steve. It was just one time. B.S. I know of at least four occasions where she went out with him for fun. How stupid do you think I am? I take that back. I think I was pretty stupid. How? I didn't see or know that my wife was cheating on me all this time. I'll never know. I guess when you're in love, it does make you deaf, dumb, blind, and stupid. But not now, Steve. She was going to break up with him the day of the accident. You have to believe that. He became too clingy. And what started out as an innocent flirtation went too far. You have to believe me, Patty. I saw them when Ed was picking Laura up from work that afternoon. I saw her get into his darn car and kiss him like she was greeting a long-lost lover, for Christ's sake. I followed them until we stopped at a stoplight, and then got out of the car to confront them. But when he saw me, he sped off. I was there when he ran the red light and was hit by that darn truck. So don't try to tell me she was getting ready to leave him. The only thing she had in mind was what she was going to do to him once they were in that room. I was already yelling. Steve, I'm so sorry. Laura loves you. And this was nothing more than a stupid affair that she regrets. Please don't do anything about it until she explains it to you in her own words. You mean lie to me, don't you? I have to admit, you were good. I never would have thought my loving wife was capable of cheating on me, and my sister-in-law made it possible. You disgust me. The phone went dead along with my marriage. Twenty minutes later, Bob Patty's husband called Steve. I didn't know crap about what the two of them were doing. You have to believe that if I had known, there's no way I would have put up with what Patty did. I sincerely apologize to you for what was done to you, and I can guarantee it won't happen again. He was right about that. Thanks, Bob. I didn't think you knew. But you don't have to worry about it anymore, Steve. I know you're really angry right now, but don't do anything you'll regret later. Take a couple of days to cool off. And if you need someone to talk to or have a drink with, I'm always at your service. I thanked him and told him there was nothing I could do at the moment anyway. Laura was still in a coma, but I told him to tell his wife to stay away from me. I drank two more beers and went to bed. I didn't sleep. Just stared up at the black ceiling. Around 10 o'clock Thursday morning, I called Carol and invited her to lunch the next day. I picked a place with a semi-detached room because I knew there would be a lot of yelling and alerted the waiter. I was already drinking my second glass when Carol showed up. She ordered a drink. I told the waiter to bring her too and leave us alone if he didn't hear any gunshots. Carol, you were right. Ed and my wife were having some sort of affair. Her sister was covering for her. And I think that when Ed was on a business trip, it was easy for the two of us to fool him. That jerk. How could he do that to me? To us? Well, at least I know what kind of person he really was. I just wish I could face him, spit in his face and make him suffer the way he made me suffer. Carol, there's something I haven't told you yet, and I want you to hear me out completely before you speak. I don't know an easy way to say it, so I'm just going to tell you. I looked at her one more time before I started. I saw them together the day of the accident. I was going to surprise Laura and take her out to lunch, but when I got to her place of work, she was already getting into your husband's car through the back window of the car. I saw her kissing him and I started to follow them. A couple blocks later, I got out of the car to confront them. And from that point on, everything went downhill. Your husband saw me and took off, and my wife went crazy in the front seat. I stopped at the stoplight. They drove through. I saw the UPS truck hit them and saw the fireman extract your husband from the car. He died instantly. I'm so sorry. I probably indirectly caused the accident, but I didn't mean to. She started yelling at me and crying at the same time. Why didn't you tell me this months ago? You knew they were cheating on us and you didn't say anything. Carol, all I saw was one kiss. That's all. But she still lashed out at me saying I killed her husband. And it's my fault she's a widow now. Carol, back off. 
I didn't say or give your husband permission to sleep with my wife. And I certainly didn't step on the gas pedal and make him run that darn red light. I was trying to figure out what the heck was going on, and if it was what I thought it was, and it right on the spot, I was shaking. I was so angry at Carol, at Laura, at Ed, at everyone and everything. But your wife is still alive while my husband is dead. You can get your questions answered and be done with it. And me, I'll just have to wonder why my husband did it. She continued to cry. I walked around the table and tried to comfort her. She tried to push me away, but I was persistent. I know you don't want to hear this, but in a way, you're lucky you can move on with your life now. Find someone else. Get married again and never worry about seeing him again. But because of the kids, I will have to see the face of a cheating wife and be constantly reminded of what we once had and lost. I might recognize the reason why, but what would that change? My marriage is over, and I'll have to grieve it just as much as you will. We ordered and ate lunch, if only because we were already there. I stopped consuming alcohol because I didn't want to add a DUI to my already long list of problems. It was about 15 minutes before we started talking again. We were connected in ways neither of us had ever thought possible. For the first time, we were talking about something other than our spouses. She told me about her daughter, and I told her about my two children, if not for the real reason for our visit. It would have been a very enjoyable lunch. Carol described her marriage as a good one, but difficult at times, as Ed was often on the road. Steve. Every marriage has problems and ours was far from perfect, but I never expected to be faced with such a surprise. If he had just told me he wasn't happy or satisfied, I know we could have resolved it one way or another. You can't solve your problems by bringing a third person into it. I'm sorry for lashing out at you. I'm just angry all the time. The resentment remains, but I so want to look him in the eye, shake him and ask him, what were you thinking? I know it will get easier, but what do I do until then? I guess you have to do what I did. Live one day at a time. Now that everything is out in the open, I'm going to have to make some hard decisions that will affect not only Laura and me, but a lot of other people. And I, like you, want to know why she left a beautiful marriage for a bed with someone else. But until she wakes up, I'll never know. We finished. A lunch and skipped dessert. Carol wasn't sure what she was going to do next, but at the top of her list was selling the house. She said she couldn't afford it anymore, and there were too many memories associated with it. I'll probably move back to Ohio and move in with my mom and dad. Thank goodness. Ed's life insurance and his pension paid off all our debts, and I can start my life with nothing behind me. I've been working part-time and told my boss yesterday that I'll be submitting my resignation at the end of the week. I know I've said this a million times before, but I'm sorry for all of this. You and your daughter don't deserve this kind of hardship. She thanked me and we walked out together. Can you drive? I asked Carol. Yes. I'm fine. Thank you for not hiding the truth from me, even though I didn't want to hear it. It's better to know than to keep thinking I might have been wrong. She kissed my cheek. Don't be a stranger. And good luck with your wife, she said, as she got in her car and drove off. When it came to Laura, I needed more than luck for the next three days. I came home after work, and between dinner and a few beers, I began to formulate a plan. When Randy called me on the fourth day to ask if everything was okay, I said I was working on the problem. By Wednesday evening, when I didn't show up at the hospital, both she and Evan came to get me. So, Dad, what's going on? You haven't visited Mom in almost a week. Maybe you're hiding something from us about her condition, asked Randy. Scared of what? I was about to tell her. Dad. We're not kids, Evan added. I wasn't going to talk about it just yet, but I figured, what the heck? It was going to come up sooner or later anyway. Kids, there's something I didn't want to tell you yet, but I started to explain as Randy started to cry. She's dying, isn't she? That's why you weren't there. When did you find out? Why didn't you tell us? She said as the tears began to flow. Calm down. Your mom isn't dying. Where did all this come from? I asked. Well, you haven't seen her all week. And I just thought that when you told me you were working on a problem, it had to do with mom. Kids. I think you should sit down to hear what I'm about to tell you. And could probably use a drink. They both declined and told me to go on. I looked them both in the eye and began. Your mother has been cheating on me for quite some time. She was with him when she was in the accident. Randy was horrified at the thought. That can't be. Mom would never cheat on you. She loves you too much. Look, I thought so too. But I was following her and her lover in my car when they were in the accident. They just looked at me like I was crazy. I spent the next hour going over in my mind everything Carol and I had figured out. From the moment I pulled up behind them at her work, to the conversations I had with Patty, 
they were as shocked as I had been a few weeks ago. Dad, there must be some mistake. You know, Mom, she would never do what you're suggesting. Randy defended Mom, hoping I was wrong about her guilt. Evan wasn't so nice, Dad. She may be my mother, but I can't justify what she did to you and Aunt Patty. She's just as much to blame as Mom. I hope I don't see her before I have a chance to cool off. Or I'll probably snap and tell her what I really think of her. I wonder if she's cheating on Uncle Bob. Questions were now pouring in from all directions. Kids, the only thing I can tell you for sure is that I'm done with your mother. I can't divorce her right now because she's on my health insurance. But I don't consider her my wife anymore. I'm going to prepare the papers, but I won't serve them on her. Until when? And if she comes out of her coma? Dad, don't do anything until you talk to Mom. I know things look bad right now, but maybe there's some other explanation, Randy pleaded with me. You mean they just rented a room at the Hilton to hang out and play board games? I didn't want to offend my daughter, but come on. We all know what she was doing there. I told her I would take things slowly. That brought her some relief. I was glad they were gone. I didn't feel like having this conversation, but I was glad it was now out in the open. The one thing I hadn't expected was even lashing out at Lori's parents on the next trip to the hospital. They noticed that I wasn't visiting their daughter anymore. Then he told them all the details, leaving nothing out. I heard they were shocked. One of the nurses had to tell, them to keep their voices down. When Evan called Laura a darn tramp, and her father took offense to it. My daughter isn't a tramp, her grandfather shouted back at him. Steve must have done something, Grandpa. My dad didn't do anything to my mom. He always treated her like a loving wife. Why? She decided to have a lover. No one knows but I will never forgive her for what she did to my father and our family. I guess it all went downhill from there. Patty sent me an email trying to explain the who, what, and why. But after reading it, I simply replied that I didn't want to hear from her anymore and deleted the email. How stupid did she think I was? So from that night on, I started to build a new life. I didn't tell anyone about my problems, but when my boss started pestering me with questions about how Laura was doing, I took him aside and told him the short version. If he felt sorry for me before, he felt doubly sorry. Now, everyone I told sympathized with me, but I accepted it. I was going to share everything. However, I realized that if she died, it would be much harder to resolve everything. So I waited. The only thing I did one weekend was write a letter to Laura. I put all my feelings into it, including resentment, and asked my daughter Randy to give it to her mother if she came out of her coma. I had already stopped going to the hospital and even only went there occasionally at Randy's insistence. Randy thought it would be best if I gave the letter to Laura, but when I told her I didn't want to see her anymore, she finally gave in. Shortly after that, Laura woke up. Chapter 2 When Laura was asleep again, Patty began to read the letter Steve had written her. Laura, if you're reading this, it means, much to my horror, that you finally come out of your coma. I don't know how many times since that fateful day I wished you had died in that car accident. The look on your face when I walked up to the driver's window that day speaks for itself. You finally got caught. Ed really was a dumb crap, wasn't he? Only a real idiot would try to drive through a busy intersection at lunchtime. In case you don't already know, he was killed in a collision. I only wish I had time to change his face, but the UPS truck beat me to it. Patty and I had a heart-to-heart -heart talk, and as you can imagine, she's no longer on my list of favorites. Ed's wife found the credit card he used to charge your little love nest, checking the dates against your date book. We put two and two together. Patty was still lying to me until I told her I didn't want to talk to her anymore. Bob called back and apologized for his stupid wife, but the damage had already been done. I have to admit you were good. I didn't expect this turn of events. And even after Carol made the accusation that you both were cheating on us, I told her she was wrong. Even now, I still find that hard to believe. How I could have been so naive and blind still upsets me. I guess when you love someone as much as I loved you, you just don't think about the fact that that person could screw you over. I hope it was worth it, lest you be blindsided. Both kids now know Randy has taken the side that everyone makes mistakes and has basically forgiven you. But Evan and your father have had more than one fight after he called you a tramp in his presence. Your parents aren't thrilled about it either, but they'll forgive you eventually. Evan is a different problem altogether. Be gentle with him because he, like so many others, is angry with you right now and doesn't understand what you were thinking. As far as I'm concerned, it's over between us. When you first crossed the threshold with your new buddy Ed, it was over for us. Patty tried to tell me it was just a one-time thing until I told her what I knew. 
Like I said, you and Patty both truly deserve an Academy Award for the roles of loving wife and caring sister. Don't wait for my vote. You're still on my health care until we settle the final details. That way, you won't be burdened with thousands of dollars in medical bills. The house will be sold, and I've tossed our bed to the curb. You were probably having fun with guys in our marital bed, and once I found out about it, I couldn't bring myself to sleep in it anymore. We can split all of our assets right down the middle, and everyone will still have their 401k retirement plan. I urge you not to make a fuss or fight this divorce, or I will get your name in the mud. Everyone will know what a real cheater you are. No one at your job knows anything, and your job will be waiting for you when you recover. As for me, I never want to see your face again. I never want to talk to you or have you email me. I wanted to know why first why you did this. Maybe it was about me or what I did or didn't do. But then I thought, what the heck? Eventually, I realized it didn't matter. Why? What mattered was that you did what you did. If you wanted to leave so badly, I would have been upset. But I would have let you go. Now I just want you to go away and disappear from my life. Yeah, I know there will be some problems in the next couple months, but I'll send you the name of my lawyer when I find one, so you can act through him instead of me. Like I said, I've been waiting for you to wake up or die, whichever comes first, before proceeding with this. So, in conclusion, I hope you live a miserable life. And when you look in the mirror and see all those darn scars, you feel the sharp pain of what you threw away. I'm not going to go over your head because you sure as heck didn't. I'm angry, bitter, and like I said, I wish you had died in that darn accident. It wasn't even signed. Patty didn't blink once throughout the entire letter. Steve had hit exactly the right target, and although she knew the intimate details of Laura's affair, she would never mention them to a living soul. She felt that if you couldn't trust blood, who could you trust? But Laura never finished reading the letter, and Patty didn't know how she would react when she finally did. Patty was worried about Laura. Patty also knew that there was no way in heck Steve would take her back. At least she would still have a job when she got out of the hospital. She told Laura more than once that she was playing with fire. But Laura insisted that there was no way Steve would ever find out about it. She fully recognized that their personal life had become boring, and she needed to spice things up a bit. However, as it turned out, it wasn't spice, but rather acid. Laura said that she was going to end the relationship because Ed was becoming too demanding and asking to spend more and more time with her. He was no longer satisfied with casual bed dates. Now he wanted dinners out and overnight dates with her. The fact that she had cheated on Steve had become known, at least in her family, and Patty hoped that their parents and Evan would finally come to their senses and forgive her. After all, family is family after all. Chapter 13 When Laura woke up, she was sure she had dreamed the whole thing. It was one of those crazy dreams that drugs induce. For the past 36 hours, she had been in and out of consciousness when she noticed Patty asleep in the chair next to her bed. She was relieved to see the person with whom she had shared so much of her life. Laura touched Patty's shoulder and saw her jump up, then looked at her. How are you feeling? asked Patty. Much better. Have you been here all night? Yes. I fell asleep a little after 10 o'clock at night. Forget about me. How are you doing? I needed that dream. I've had the craziest dreams. Fortunately, they were only nightmares. Then she saw the letter in Patty's lap. Oh, crap. It wasn't a dream, she said, bursting into tears again. Laura, look at me, Patty told her calmly. If you don't calm down, they're going to put you under the knife again. Do you understand? Laura nodded. You have to realize that Steve knows everything. Even if you were careful, you left a paper trail and now everyone knows he doesn't want you back. And he waited until you woke up to divorce you. Patty, there may be a chance. If I can talk to him, I can make him realize that this was just a silly affair and just fun. Maybe he'll give me another chance. Will you talk to him? Laura, I'm one of the last people he wants to talk to. Remember, you used me as an alibi. Heck, it took me weeks to get my husband to forgive me when he found out what I'd done. Bob thought I was lying to him, too. No. The only one you have a chance with is Randy. She's forgiven us both. And keep Steve updated on your progress. Steve may be listening to her, but I sincerely doubt it. I told you what would happen if he found out. I know, I know, but it was so mischievous at first. And then it just became entertainment. When Ed was in town... Having someone actively pursuing me made me feel young again. Only this time I was going to follow through if he asked me to. I know it was stupid, and I let things get out of hand. But I never thought I would get caught. Patty. I never felt any love for Ed, and I never loved Steve any less. Laura. That's the problem. 
You didn't think she was right for the next two days. Laura was probed, probed and probed. Everything was normal or normal enough for her to be discharged. She would need additional surgery on her right arm and lower left leg to remove small bone fragments. But that could be done at any time in the future. Randy has been by her side every step of the way and has prepared a bedroom in her apartment for her mother. I took almost all of your clothes out of the house, and Dad left your car at my place a couple days ago. He paid the insurance on it for the rest of the year. Dad's going out of town in a week or so, and he said you could come in the house and take whatever you wanted. He said he wants to put it on the market as soon as everything is cleaned up. I have a bunch of cards for you at home, probably from everyone you know. After a week or so, I told everyone no more flowers. Your room started to look like a flower store. I'll pick you up tomorrow morning in Evan's van. It'll be easier for you to get in and out than my little car. Get some rest today. We have a big day tomorrow. With those words, Randy left, at least for the time being. Laura spent the last night in the hospital lamenting what she had done and trying to think of a way to get Steve back, if possible, or at least get him to talk to her. Maybe after a good night's sleep, she would figure out how to do it. After three weeks at Randy's, they were allowed to go back to the house. Steve and a few friends had gone out of town. Laura and Randy had all day Saturday and Sunday to look around. The house was a mess. What caught their attention were particles of ashes and broken glass in the fireplace in the family room. Photos. There were all the photos from their entire marriage. Most of them had turned to charred ash, but a few on the side still remained. It looked like Steve had just thrown them in there, flicked a match, and left. Sort of like what Laura did with her marriage. She thought. Gone were the wedding photos, pictures taken on family trips, and even two family portraits. How could Dad do that if he didn't need them? I would have taken them. And now we have nothing from all the vacations and trips. Randy looked longingly at the charred remains in the fireplace. Randy, I think that was the idea, Laura said, as she sat down on the hearth and pulled out whatever else was left. Other than furniture, there wasn't much left. They filled three large trash bags with things, and while Randy loaded them into the car, Laura took one last look around. Twenty-four years together and all that was left were clothes, a few mementos, and two wonderful children, one of whom still didn't really talk to her. The last thing Laura had taken was the lilting lizard Steve had given her for their first Christmas. Money had been tight, and they had agreed not to exchange gifts, but Laura guessed he'd seen her looking at it in the store and somehow found the money. It was the first thing they put out during the holidays, and the last thing they put away. She was even surprised he hadn't burned that, too. Such an old thing should have flared up like a match, brushing away another tear. She slammed the door shut and stepped out of her old life and into Randy's waiting car. For the next four months, Steve and Laura shared their lives. Money, stocks, pensions, everything went to crap. He was much fairer than she would have been had the terms been reversed. When the house was sold, they split the profits and he filed papers in court. Now they were 100% living apart so there was nothing to argue about. Laura thought to see him before the decision was final, but Randy said it didn't matter to him. He bought a two-bedroom apartment near downtown and lived on without her. Evan eventually recovered, but they were never as close as they had been before the accident. A year after the divorce, Randy and her boyfriend got engaged, and Laura found a small one-bedroom apartment in a historic part of town. She had gone back to work, and while she wasn't having serious money problems, the wedding would cost more than Laura could afford on her own. They had dinner on Sunday. Evan, his wife Kate, Randy, her fiancé Dan, and Laura. They were discussing the wedding and going through numerous lists of documents here. Evan said, pushing an envelope, toward Randy and his mother, Dad wanted me to give this to you. He said it should make life a little easier. Randy opened the envelope and pulled out a check. It was a check for $20,000. It was accompanied by a short note. My girl deserves the wedding of her dreams. For the past 15 months. Randy and Steve had barely spoken. They had argued more than once, and he had told her that if her mother was going to attend the wedding, he wouldn't. That was three months ago, and they hadn't spoken since. Randy looked at the check in her hand and turned to her mother. Maybe this means he changed his mind and decided to come. Evan didn't look as optimistic as Randy and Laura. Mom, even still, I still think we should limit ourselves to little. There's no point in going into debt for a wedding and reception that no one but a few people will remember in five years. Randy called to thank her father, but he didn't answer. She left a message thanking him for his generosity. The message also informed her that her mother would be attending her daughter's wedding. Randy told her mother that he never responded. 
after she left the first message unanswered. Subsequent emails and calls also went unanswered. Apparently, she had gotten a response but sent him an invitation anyway. Evan couldn't or wouldn't tell his mother and sister whether Steve was coming or not. If he didn't come, he was going to walk his sister down the aisle and marry her off. And that was the plan the night of the rehearsal. Randy was happy and sad at the same time. She didn't hope her father would come, but knowing him, there wasn't much chance. Tell him I won't be there, Laura told her daughter. I've had the pleasure of planning your wedding, and I've even seen how it's all going to go down. He's your father. He's earned the right to marry you off. I'm the reason he's not coming, and I can never forgive myself if I ruin the most important day of your life, she told her daughter. I've come this far without him, and a few more steps won't change a thing. Chapter 4 From Day 1 I had no intention of attending Randy's wedding, especially knowing that Laura would be there. She had turned our marriage into a laughingstock, and I hated her with every fiber of my being. I don't know how many nights I lay awake praying for something bad to happen to her, or for her to relapse from the accident. Even the mere mention of her name pissed me off. God, I hated that woman. It took me six months of therapy and anger management counseling to get any sort of control over my emotions. When it came to Laura, I'd hoped that after ruining our happy family, she'd skip the wedding and skip the ceremony. But since Randy had forgiven her and her darn sister, she thought everyone should do the same, not me. Randy worked on me for months, and when she couldn't make it work, Evan started when I heard money was getting tight. I cashed in a couple of bonds and sent her enough money to make the day memorable. When Evan said he was going to walk her down the aisle and give her in marriage, I felt an emptiness in my gut. Darn her. When would it end? Two days later, in the day before the wedding, I realized it would never end. Not until she and I were dead for the rest of our lives. I would have to deal with her for the sake of the kids. Did I still hate her? Passionately. But at least now I could control it. I didn't tell anyone I was coming. I made sure my tuxedo was immaculate. And with my new haircut, I looked good. Better than I had in the last six months. I parked the car and made my way to the back of the church, where Evan was waiting for me. Jesus, Dad, you did it. I'm going to go tell Randy you're not going to do anything like that. I want this to be my surprise and pre-wedding present for her. You know Mom's here, don't you? I'm aware of that. Why don't you go and sit next to her and I'll join you after I give my girl away? He gave me a big hug and told me he was glad I was here. Randy looked beautiful, and just looking at her made my heart sink. It was a minute or two before she noticed me as she looked for her brother. Daddy! She screamed and threw herself into my outstretched arms, kissing me. Do you really think I would miss my own daughter's wedding? What kind of father would I be? Everything was fine for her now. As the music began, we waited our turn while the bridesmaids and flower girls went about their business. Are you ready for this, Dad? I've been ready for this for a long time. Well then, let's start the next chapter in your life. Holding her hand in mine, we proudly walked down the aisle. None of the guests had any idea that I wasn't going to attend, but the people in the front rows were shocked by my presence, including the groom. However, everyone was smiling as we walked down the aisle. I gave my daughter's hand to Dan, whispered something in his ear, smiled, and sat next to my son in the first pew. Laura looked at me, smiled, mumbled a thank you, and went back to watching the two of them. Twenty minutes later, it was over. They were introduced as Mr. and Mrs. Dan and Randy Cooper, and they walked down the aisle, becoming husband and wife. We headed to the registration line. I greeted our guests and thanked them for coming. From time to time, I noticed Laura looking in my direction, when our gazes met. She quickly averted her eyes. The reception went off without a hitch. The food was good, the orchestra a little loud for my taste, but I danced twice with my daughter, and even once with her new mother-in-law. She said she was glad I finally pulled my head out of my butt. Her words, not mine. It was about 11 o'clock when Laura came up to me and stood behind me. I was just watching people dancing and probably indulging in a memory when I heard her voice behind me. Thanks for coming. It made a huge difference to Randy. I thought I owed her a debt of gratitude, especially for the hard time I've given her over the past two years. Besides, I love parties, especially when I'm paying for them. Just so you know, it was never you. It was all me. You've been everything I could have asked for. I'm just sorry I realized it too late. It's all in the past. We can't go back and undo what's already been done. So I move on, and I don't hate you anymore. I lied a lot by saying that, but I did it to be nice. Why don't we have lunch sometime and talk? You never gave me a chance to explain everything. It took all my strength not to rip her darn head off and spit in her neck. What did she think? Where are we going? To be friends now? 
Maybe, but not for long. Plus, I'm dating someone and I don't think it would be appropriate. Lie number two. I said to myself with those words. I went in search of Evan. I thanked Evan for helping my sister, kissed his wife and told her not to let him drink too much. She smiled and said they had a hotel room booked. I tracked down Randy and Dan and told them I was hitting the road. Dad, I love you so much. I saw you talking to Mom. I'm glad you finally made up. I smiled through clenched teeth and wished her a fun and peaceful honeymoon. Then slipped them $1,000 bills, a little extra spending money. I told them. Two minutes later, I was already out the door and headed for my car. I was glad I had decided to go, especially after confronting my ex-wife and acting like a real adult. I had come a long way, and today I had truly closed the last chapter in my marriage. For the first time, I felt at peace with myself. Epilogue. In the limousine heading to the airport, a jubilant Randy exchanged spit and tongues with her new husband. She was still rejoicing at how well everything had gone, especially with her parents. She felt a sense of pride, knowing that she had played a big part in getting them in the same room. That was really great, wasn't it? She asked Dan, kissing him deeply, looking into his eyes. By the way, what did my father whisper to you at the altar when he handed me over to you? She asked Dan, sipping her glass of champagne. Dan got this look on his face. He said, if I ever hurt you, he'd hunt me down like a dog. Well, I guess you'd better heed his wishes. I guess my father never forgets anything. Advised a very wise Randy. Thanks for listening. Please don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already.